Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Ines, and, and welcome, everyone. So this is the ITF IoT Directorate online meeting. And as you know, it's one of the roles of us at, at the IETF IoT Directorate is to facilitate communication and information sharing across organizations who are working on these relevant IoT topics. So what we are doing here now is starting a new series of meetings where we invite representatives from other organizations to tell about their activities in this area and also to discuss opportunities for, for future information sharing, collaboration, uh, etc. So the discussions we'll have in this series of meetings, they are informal presentations. Since at the director, we are not responsible for the official license, that's the IAB's role. But we do hope that these sessions will be able to bring useful information to the community and can also perhaps work as a starting point for, for a closer collaboration. So today, in this uh, first session, we have a presentation from Wild William Diab from the Industry IoT Consortium, IIC. Uh, Wild is the secretary of the IIC steering committee, and also he chairs the IIC liaison working group, IIC technology working group, and the industry analytics task group. So with that introduction, Wild, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ari. Uh, and I wanted to thank the IETF and the IoT Directorate, as well as Ari and Ines for all of their help in putting this together. Um, you know, please feel free to um, stop or interrupt with any questions. Uh, hopefully this is the beginning of a conversation between both organizations and um, leading to some interesting collaboration in the area of industrial IoT. Um, so as, as Ari mentioned, I have a few roles. I'm going to be giving you a little bit of an overview of the organization. We do quite a bit in terms of um, within IIC. So I think the approach that we had discussed was to show as broad of um, um, sample of the activities that we do. And um, we're certainly happy to follow up um, with more detailed um, information on any of it. Um, I've divided the presentation kind of into four sections, a little bit of an overview of the of the organization itself, and then uh, the bulk of it will be looking at uh, the different areas of the work program. And then um, I have, as an example, um, one of the task groups that I, uh, I um, am responsible for looks at AI and analytics. So we'll look at one of the outputs that we put out just to kind of give you a little bit of a feel of how um, some of these frameworks are. And then last but not least, um, IIC produces the program for um, the IoT Solutions World Congress. So um, that may be something uh, that is of interest, which of course now like everything else is uh, virtual. So I think for those of you that are familiar with um, with industrial IoT, this may, may just be more of a, a review, but you know, a lot of people talk about the industrial IoT or industrial internet or um, as the fourth uh, revolution, and it comes with a lot of promise. Um, and you can see sort of the previous revolutions, including the internet and industrial uh, revolutions. And it's it has a lot of potential. It's driving requirements moving forward. However, it's also um, still has quite a bit of issues in terms of widespread adoption, whether it's, you know, specific technology issues like, you know, connectivity, big data, or it's the lack of standardization, system integration, uh, security trustworthiness issues. Um, these have hampered um, the ability to get to the full potential of the industrial IoT opportunity. And that is really what IIC is here to help uh, remove or um, help in it increase the adoption. So the vision of the consortium is quite simple. It's um, it's to uh, be the leading organization to transform business and, um, by, and society by accelerating the industrial IoT. We are an open neutral sandbox where, you know, different um, stakeholders can come to collaborate um, with the uh, goal of uh, innovating and enabling uh, industrial IoT adoption. And I just want to emphasize this idea of neutral because we do not publish uh, standards ourselves. We have frameworks. We frequently refer to other standards or our work gets used by 
standards development organizations we're not um in in the um but we're not in the business of uh, picking between standards but rather bringing together you know what the opportunity looks like and some of the requirements uh, emerging requirements in in the area so we have about um at the current i think it's a, a over 150 organizations spanning uh, 24 countries um and that number has obviously fluctuated um um, over the last couple of years. In terms of the way the organization is structured, we have our steering committee, which is uh, kind of like the organizational board that oversees the organization. And then we're divided into six working groups, the digital transformation working group, liaison, marketing, security, technology, and industry. Uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, more about the working groups or the work areas and the work program. Um, and then we typically, in our structure, have task groups or contributing groups. Task groups are tend to be the uh, more permanent setup, uh, assigned um, sort of more longer term deliverables versus co contributing groups are more short term lived or uh, specific focus groups that are set up uh, underneath the working groups. Um, I apologize, there's a typo on this. I'll skip that for a second. In terms of our current um, steering committee leadership, I'm the secretary, Richard Soli is the executive director and Bob is the, uh, is the chair. Um, I just wanna spend a little bit of time because it, this is um, not your sort of usual way um, you see some of these alliances or organizations work. So one of the things that we strive to do is kind of connect the different deliverables together. And I know that I have not told you yet what test beds are, um, but um, just for a second, maybe take it, um, um, keep it in as a black box. But some of the deliverables that we do revolve around, you know, documents or frameworks. And this is what you see in the bottom left-hand corner. This is the typical sort of, you know, here is we've published something and the industry can use. You can find all of these that we've published on our uh, website. Um, they're free to download. Uh, we also put together, you know, uh, business type tools. So we have something called the resource hub is a perfect example of this. And then we have these test beds, which I will describe a little later on in more detail. Um, and the idea is that we have an interplay between these different deliverables, meaning that, for instance, the test beds can be used to prove out um, the, uh, the requirements that we identify in some of our um, frameworks that we produce and vice versa, that some of these test beds raise issues that the documents have not themselves highlighted and we go through and, and reverse them. So this is a little bit of a unique approach that we have uh, taken. Um, one thing, uh, and this is, this is now a couple of years old, but for those of you that may have been sort of casually following what's going on, there was IIC and Open Fog, and uh, we we did merge. Um, IIC is also part of um, a family of uh, programs that is run by the Object Management Group. Um, there is uh, one thing that's of interest is uh, some of our membership classes allow for cross collaboration between um, the different uh, groups, specifically. Um, from this picture, Digital Twin, BPM, and uh, IIC. So if you're a member of one, you can have uh, some level of participation in the others. So to dive a little bit into the um, uh, in, in, into some of the areas. So in terms of uh, one of the functions of the liaison working group, and this may be a little bit um, of an odd type of uh, idea to have a working group that's uh, just dedicated to building uh, liaisons, but it's really more than just having the agreements. It's trying to set up an ecosystem. As we see a lot of um, standards development organizations, um, alliances, open source communities that are looking at uh, developing industrial IoT. And one of the key things is to be able to try and harmonize some of these requirements that are coming out. So. We've got over 50 relationships that have been uh, set up. Um, so if you look at our vision and mission that I mentioned for the organization, in terms of the liaison working group, it um, it's, uh, facilitates these interactions as well as coordinates our internal stakeholder interests and requests for external organizations. So it's kind of like 
the the funnel for us um, going between the outside world and internally what we're uh, looking at. Some of the things that we've done, um, you know, in terms of strategic objectives, like I mentioned, you know, building these relationships between the different types of organizations externally, um, and then examples of collaboration. We've had, um, you know, joint workshops. I know this was an idea that perhaps may be interesting uh, down the line between uh, IIC and IETF. We've had technical workshops uh, that are focused on very specific uh, items. Uh, we've had uh, co-located uh, workshops where we've hosted uh, one or one or one organization has hosted. Um, we've uh, set up uh, relationships with organizations that are focused on verticals, some that are focused on standards development, and some that are focused on standards in uh, related areas. So you can see quite a uh, wide uh, breadth. And this, you know, um, I hope it's the latest, but if it's not, please uh, for, forgive that. But um, in terms of the structure and what we do in the liaison group, so as I mentioned, our goal is to facilitate the collaboration and we do that through, we have a couple of standing task groups. One deals with um, looking at standards, both from the perspective of requirements, as well as, um, you know, kind of pre-processing um, any of the uh, liaison agreements. And the other is focused on the open source uh, communities. Um, we also have set up over time various uh, contributing groups, and these tend to help coordinate feedback um, or uh, collaboration on specific uh, organization. Um, for example, um, one of the areas that we've had a lot of collaboration with is uh, under ISO and IEC, um, JTC1 um, uh, Subcommittee 41, which looks at IoT. We've done a lot of uh, feedback and um, review of each other's documents. Uh, we also have a mechanism to set up uh, ex external uh, with liaison partners, these joint uh, groups or whether task groups or contributing groups, in some cases they're used for planning or collaboration like the one we had with IVI in Japan and uh, more recently with Industry 4.0 on, um, and I believe that we use that to develop a joint paper. Um, we have an internal classification that we use, you know, we kind of put um, organizations into these general four buckets. It's not always um, that straightforward because some organizations do more than one function. So it's not intended to be accurate, just to kind of give you an idea. But uh, so standards development organizations, open source communities, uh, government type of organizations, and then industry alliances and that shows you a little bit of the split of um, the types of organizations that we work with. Um, these are just pictures, you know, for different types of um, um, workshops that we've conducted around the world. And um, you can see lots of interest, lots of um, presentations and so on. And, and again, these will be included. I saw there was one question pop up if uh, I can share the slides and absolutely. Um, and yes, lots of ties. I know that's not a big, big from my the few IETF meetings that I went to. Um, um, in terms of the technology working group, um, so our charter is really to develop, you know, and define common architectures and looking at um, emerging requirements in a number of different areas. As a working group, the typically the technology working group itself uh, tends to be focused more on governance as well, sort of the high level. Um, areas and we we divide ourselves into task groups that, that take a look at um, the different uh, emerging areas. So for example, um, here within um, you know what may be very relevant to IETF our connectivity and networking, for instance. Um, architecture is one of our oldest ones. You know, we've also had ones that have focused on uh, specific areas like edge. Uh, the distributed ledger one has completed its work and um, in terms of the technology and has been moved over to marketing. And then one of the other longstanding ones has been in terms of uh, vocabulary. Um, we also have the one I, um, I, I chair is on industrial AI previously it was industrial analytics and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, just to give you a little bit of, because um, I know the word architecture can be, uh, can mean different things to different people. So the way we're using it, uh, 
we kind of build our what we call an architectural description um, on top of ISO IEC IEEE 42010. And so this is a, a standard that looks at um, how you would describe a complex system from different viewpoints. And within IIC, within our architectural viewpoint, we've taken We've defined four viewpoints. One is a business viewpoint, a usage, functional, and implementation. I'll, sh I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, for each viewpoint, the idea is that you define who your stakeholders are, what their concerns are, and then you have a, um, a description that contributes to the overall architecture for that particular view. And so you can see here, this is, uh, for example, for a functional viewpoint, a system decomposition that looks at the, the various functional domains and their interaction with each other um, as, as an example of one of those slices of the viewpoints. And again, my apologies of moving quickly to try and cover as much material rather than going into depth. Um, happy to do uh, more either during the presentation or um, Q&A or we can follow up uh, afterwards. We have a security working group and, you know, their focus is to kind of look at security, privacy and trustworthiness issues. Um, they do everything from looking at end to end use cases to um, um, having frameworks and guidance in terms of um, uh, these areas and issues. Um, and they've also contributed to building um, that component into the test beds. So when our test beds are evaluated, we don't only look for the technology component, we look for um, the security component. So one way to kind of think about uh, what we are doing for security here is, is it's layered on top of, at least from our view, um, our IRA is the uh, our reference architecture. Sorry for not introducing the acronym earlier. So if you kind of had a system view, you had a functional view, um, you know, the security viewpoint would be layered on top of that. And these are examples of some of um, some of the areas that we um, work on or help uh, bring out the requirements for uh, deploying uh, industrial IoT uh, solutions. Our digital transformation working group, this previously used to be called our business strategy and solutions lifecycle uh, working group. And, you know, the idea here is to provide uh, guidance and best practice for all aspects of, um, you know, developing in, an industrial IoT solution from a business point of view. And, um, you know, we start by looking at things like, you know, on, on one hand, the use cases that are, um, that are coming out, which are quite uh, diverse and from across a, a, a large number of um, application domains. So we compile those and also use that to kind of distill out uh, guidance um, uh, that not only is used for, you know, this group, but it's also used across the board um, for our technology development as an example. Um, alongside that, you know, we provide guidance in terms of things like, you know, risk mitigation, um, how you would do testing, rollout, and some of uh, more recently, the focus on digital transformation, which is really, um, a fancy way of saying it, looking at the pain points of, of, of applying industrial IoT technology into new uh, areas and, and use cases. Our marketing group, uh, well, looks at marketing, unsurprisingly, and I think perhaps the easiest uh, way to look at this is to show you some examples of what marketing does. So it, they have covered everything from um, looking at things like uh, case studies, which, you know, our members come come in and describe some of these new initiatives um, to, um, you know, holding, um, well, I guess previously physical um, event series where we partner up with um, regional organizations that um, um, and then hold workshops uh, to help promote the work and identify some of the gaps that exist. Um, it's also looked at some of the, uh, you know, raising awareness uh, in the marketplace in terms of some of these emerging issues and, and requirements that are happened. Um, and together with the industry group have looked at the various vertical um, vertical markets and, and applications. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, um, marketing works hand in hand with uh, either security or technology. So for example, 
um, you know, more recently looking at some of the automotive applications, marketing has created um, a number of task groups to help um, uh, drive and promote some of the solutions and, and issues that we've identified. These are examples of, um, you know, case studies that were submitted by uh, members. I'm not going to go through them in detail. You can find all of them on our on our website, but generally speaking, you know, they, they describe very large scale types of problems and some of the industrial IoT solutions that have been um, applied in, in those areas. Our industry, uh, our industry working group, and I've noted here that this was previously called our testbed working group, focuses a lot on sort of the um, more where the rubber meets the road and initially was focused on test beds. Um, it has since expanded to also look at some of these things that we call test drives as well. Um, so just to, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I would give you a little bit more information in terms of what a test bed does. Um, and the idea is here really to um, sort of bring together a lot of these concepts that come out, whether it's from the IT point of view or the operational point of view, put them together and really help um, identify um, whether, you know, whether or not this is a real opportunity and from that uh, take insights out. So um, here are examples of some of these test beds. We've got everything from, you know, more of um, uh, sort of like the smart manufacturing type of um, areas, but we also have things in uh, healthcare, um, communication, energy management, uh, transportation, and so on. So there's a variety of these uh, of these test beds. So a different way to look at uh, or to state what a test bed is is, you know, roughly speaking, to look at whether or not you know these controlled experimentation platforms conform to you know the IIC technical references where solutions can be deployed and tested in environments that resemble real world conditions. So um, they can either be, you know, to explore untested technologies or they could be existing technologies working together in a new fashion. A lot of the challenges that we see with industrial IoT is really kind of bringing together um, technologies that may exist um, in, uh, in certain areas but have not been uh, 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 used or brought in to others. Like, you know, when we talk about the digital transformation, let's say of a particular industry or sector, a lot of that involves bringing in technologies that may already exist, let's say in an enterprise IT world, but have not been used in that application domain. So that brings its own set of challenges. Sometimes it's looking at untested technologies that were specifically developed for a particular use case and the idea is to try and use that to sort of um, have a, a proof point or a real world type of condition to see how that works and from that we can extrapolate and see okay do we um, uh, does it really meet our requirements is it something in the requirements that we've missed um, and so on so um, in terms of test bed results we look for um, you know innovation uh, what what has been realized? What best practices have been learned? Standards? Are, is there anything noteworthy that that has been used? Um, is there something that is there a gap that has been identified that should be um, the you know topic of a future standard? Uh, what technical references were used and so on? We also have a program that we've developed called um, testbed badges, meaning that you know in terms of trying to have more of a um, quantitative rather than qualitative approach for uh, some of these test beds and whether and how they use our existing reference base of documents and a test bed depending on uh, what the test bed promoters uh, like to put together um, may, uh, for example, focus on industrial analytics and uh, within that we then have a set of guidelines for what would get you one uh, one sort of badge, a two badge level or three badge level. Uh, these are some examples of, of test beds. You know, the TSN test bed uh, was one example that won quite a few awards. Uh, a smart factory uh, web test bed was another one. And you can see one of the things to mention is, you know, the test beds themselves have a set of collaborators uh, so these are the organizations that bring together 
the testbed and they get to define uh, what the testbed will do, the various stages that it will go through. Um, you know, a lot of the um, IP and so on is, is uh, controlled by the, the, the people that come to bring it together. There's a promoter agreement that they execute with uh, IIC. Um, and it's up to them, you know, in terms of how much um, of the um, results to, to make public, but typically um, all the test beds um, go through um, coming up with these test bed digests or results that we then, um, with the promoters agreement, uh, publish on the IIC website. And you can go onto our website and, and look for yourself and see some of the results. So maybe I'll take a quick pause here and see if there's any questions about the overall program of work and before kind of showing you an example of one of the frameworks that we've published. I don't know, perhaps the question for Ari or Ines is, is do you typically look for questions that come up um, through the chat or the people just um, interrupt or I can so, do it at the end? Yeah. It, it it varies. I did post um in the chat that like if someone has a question, feel free to use the raise hand uh, feature of WebEx, and then we can do, do the mic line there. I think it's um good. We have a clarifying questions in during the presentation, but then if it's a, a longer discussion, they maybe taking tens of minutes. We could have it in the end. Um, but now I see already two questions in the queue. So maybe Samita, if you want to go first. And Samita, that we cannot hear you. Sorry, I was double muted. Um, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, good. Um, so thank you, Ari, and thanks, Oil, for the nice presentation so far. I have a quick question. Um, so would you be able to give us a breakdown of the um, of the vendors, operators, and the OT companies in the membership of IIHC? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, we used to split them into large, small industry, academia, and um, sort of like, you know, not nonprofit. And we we kind of took that out in part because the it, it kept changing and, and and maybe that's not some of the classification. but. The, the short answer to your question, um, I mean, I could follow up with our staff and, you know, see if they have a, a better breakdown in terms of numbers, but we do typically um, have a lot of, you know, vendors on the both IT and OT side. Um, mm -hmm. We have had, as far as operators, if I'm, um, uh, I, I believe we had a few operators join in the past. I don't know if there's any current members, uh, but it, that is something I can um, we can go back and check uh, offline. Okay, thank you. No problem. So Samita asked the first half of my question. The second half, uh, you talked, uh, you, you said that you had academia and nonprofit members how does that work yeah are you uh thanks for the question karsten are you asking in terms of you know like membership fees and so on or are you asking in terms of how they engage both i mean often often uh, um organizations have a fig leaf uh, academia membership but that, that really doesn't give the member any access so I, i'm just trying to to check how how you are handling ah, okay. academia, nonprofit, open source uh, uh, members. Yeah, thanks, that's a good question. So, no, in terms of our members, I mean, once you're a member, you're a member. We don't have, you know, kind of like a, you know, if you're an academic member, you get less uh, thing. We have different fee structures set up for, um, you know, the sort of small versus, uh, we, have, we have two large tier memberships, um, the full membership, it, at, I think it's 50k, and then there's uh, and we call innovator at half of that, with some difference in terms of the what you get, and then we have a small um, uh, a small uh, business type of membership, which is 
I think if I remember right, don't quote me on these like 5,000. And then uh, we have an a academia nonprofit um, tier, which I believe might be at the same sort of fee structure. But I think for the latest fee structures, you know, it's best to kind of refer to the website membership area. But as yeah. far as um, as far as you know, engaging in the organization once you're a member, uh, you are a member. Um, so um, you know, you have access to to everything. I there there are slight differences. For example, when we have the physical meeting the number of representatives that you get for free to send to a particular meeting. Um, so there are slight variations there in some of the tiers, but as far as access to materials and things like that, it's um, um, it's all the same. Our steering committee also has, you know, in terms of representation, we have elected positions that are, um, uh, uh, actually, I, it, it, we have positions that represent the, different segments that we have. So, for example, our current chair of the steering committee himself is elected um, representing sort of the uh, academia and uh, nonprofit. He's mm -hmm. from uh, MITRE. Uh, we also have uh, a seat for the small industry. We have a couple of seats for large industry. And then um, we have a set of contributing members and founders that um, that you can also participate in. And those are elected by by that uh, by the the members that are on that um, seat. So, if you're interested more in the governance of of the organization, I'm happy to um, answer any more questions or or discuss. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm mostly interested in in uh, whether it's uh, worthwhile for uh, academics or not, open source projects uh, to actually join and and uh, increase their their visibility. Uh, maybe we can take that offline. Yeah, um, actually, one of our steering committee members is the University of Purdue, and um, they actually had been engaged in um, in Open Fog. And when we merged together, they were uh, one of the organizations that has uh, remained on our steering committee. I should also mention that we do have an um, an incubation type program where we um, also uh, help you know some of the uh, smaller. Uh, organizations like startups that want to engage, um, I forget the details, but they get um, a free membership uh, for a certain period of time before, you know, they would convert to a paid membership. But good Sounds question. Great. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so maybe if there aren't any others, I'll press on and we can certainly do more Q&A um, at the end. If we have time. Um, so. The industrial AI and 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 analytics uh, group. This used to be initially was founded to be an industrial analytics uh, task group, and we expanded it to AI. And you know we've done a number of things. From it's one of these hot topics where we've set up a bunch of you know panels and workshops. This is an example of one um, that I moderated. These are a couple of other ones that we've had um, over the years. Again. Um, one of the downside of of doing a lot of this stuff virtually is you don't get very good pictures <laughs> um like you do when you had the the face to face and it's uh even now looking at pictures where people aren't wearing masks is um is a little um sort of reminds you of the the time we're in um but you know one of the things we've used these panels for is to explore what areas we want to go to and sometimes you know we found that this is quite a good way to identify what we want to do next. Uh, one of the strengths of, I think, maybe going to Samita's earlier question is because it's an organization that's fairly diverse in terms of its membership, whether you look at it as size of organization or type of um, uh, organizations engaged, are they coming from the IT side, the OT side? Um, there's lots of ideas and there are lots of problems to solve. And, um, you know, by bringing people together and sort of asking these questions, what's top of mind, um, you know, it helps guide us to producing um, our frameworks, our deliverables. So um, I'm going to talk about something that is published. You can download this. We actually initially built a white paper um, and we then expanded that to become what we call one of our frameworks. So the frameworks uh, um, adhere more to that, uh, you know, the, the various viewpoints that I showed you. Uh, so you can download this. Um, this is kind of like the brief 
deck that we pulled together um, to introduce the topic. And the idea of the IIAF was to look at industrial analytics from the point of view of what um, you know a decision maker, whether he or she may be from the technology or technical side, like a system architect, a designer, or from the business side uh, would look at. And um, it's really trying to look at you know, requirements and cross-cutting issues uh, when you deploy these things. So um, this gives you a little bit of an overview of what the document kind of looks like, the way we divided it. So not surprisingly, you see kind of the four various viewpoints and I've extracted a point for each of these on one of the following slides to give you a little bit of a taste of um, the topics that are in there. And then, you know, the sort of back half of the, the, uh, the document talks about some of these um, cross-cutting issues that we see across, you know, like, you know, AI and big data. And again, you know, um, looking back, we had identified AI as uh, an early area for us to look at. And since then, we now have, we are working on an AI framework. Um, but other things like modeling and analytic methods and sort of system characteristics tend to cut across. So um, um, this is a little bit, you know, more detail, um, perhaps it's a little much to try and cover this um, in a call, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but this shows you sort of examples of each of what uh, the viewpoints cover. So like under the business viewpoint, you know, the idea of creating business value, right? That that tends to be a major theme when you look at uh, the deployment of an industrial IoT solution. And while that may seem very simple and obvious upfront, creating business value may mean different things to different people, right? You know, and, and certainly measured very differently. If you're looking at, um, from example, an OT point of view, keeping a factory up, they may have a particular measure like OE that they're looking at for, versus from an IT point of view uh, and so on. So uh, again, you know, this is a repeat of a slide that was shown before to just sort of set the stage that how these viewpoints work. So um, rather than repeat it, I'll dive into um, you know some of um, the examples here of the various viewpoints. So um, under creating business value, you know we kind of explore within uh, deploying industrial IoT. What are some of the uh, things that you know large um, organizations and also by region um, uh, tend to be highlighted? So in this particular case, we looked at a couple of uh, different surveys and. From that, you know, you could see, um, you know, rankings in terms of different functions that might be uh, of interest. So predictive analytics, for example, tends to score quite highly um, in, in a lot of these, uh, these areas. If you look at the right hand side, you know, whether or not independent of whether or not, you know, a particular organization was uh, looking at, to, it has industrial IoT today in terms of identifying with that. Um, um, overwhelmingly looking at analytics and the use of data in their organization was something that's very key moving forward. So um, this idea of, you know, monetizing, you know, the use of data and being able to provide insights uh, was very key. And we explore what that means um, for different organizations, right? I mean, it's not maybe monetize is not um, perhaps the best word to use here. It's not as in being able to sell information from the data as much as being able to transform the data into uh, insights that are useful to the organization. In terms of the usage viewpoint, you know, the example here is we kind of take a look at um, uh, the various types of analytics and we bucket them into different areas, things like descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics and the use, right? And as you kind of move from descriptive to prescriptive, um, the analytics are quite more involved, but the expectation on the analytics increases. And some of the things that are associated with the analytics, you can see on the right-hand side, you know, uh, the contextualization, timing, safety, correctness uh, become more important. For the functional viewpoint, the example here that we've extracted uh, to demonstrate this is how um, you know, if you look at the functional domains on the right hand side, you could see that there are um, these domains can interact with each other 
in a number of ways and uh, associated with that is a time horizon. So typically when you look at control and the physical systems, you know, that machine, it's more of a machine time horizon and it's very different than when you're looking at a planning time horizon where, you know, the business um, uh, domain and its requirements might be interacting um, uh, with the other domains. And we we typically decompose, you know, this into, you can see on the left-hand side, the five different domains. And this is just an example from the timing point of view of how these uh, different domains and their requirements can interact with each other. So again, you know, pieces of this may be very obvious if you're working in this area, like let's say you're developing industrial control systems and looking at sensing actuation types of uh, situations, but the notion of when this is put in, within the context of everything else, what does that mean for the architectural description? Perhaps one of the most popular parts of the, both the paper originally and the, um, and the framework that followed um, is our implementation viewpoint. And more specifically, uh, one of the questions that we tried to answer by example is, where should the analytics be performed? So, you know, anyone that's ever looked at this understands that the analytics are never done in just one place. It's spread over uh, the entire system and depending on what the objective is and the perspective that you're looking at, um, there are different components that go in. But what we did is rather than, you know, kind of come in and say, you know, look, if you run in the cloud or on the edge and, you know, kind of build arguments for that, we instead started with the premise that we understand it's going to be running everywhere, but why don't we show you examples? And we used, you know, a plant enterprise and cloud and looked at different factors that would affect where you would deploy your analytics. So kind of by example, showing uh, how this would work and, you know, things like, you know, temporal co correlation in terms of the timing of the systems to, um, you know, compliance uh, in terms of different regions may affect where you run the analytics. Certainly, we know now, you know, from uh, different emerging, you know, regulations, you know, uh, data, the use of data and the transfer of data may provide constraints. Uh, things like response time that you're looking at for the analytics, you know, um, if you're looking for something that's um, going back to the functional part of the description that's more on a machine time horizon, then obviously something towards the edge makes more sense. But if you're looking for um, perhaps something in the business planning domain where you can look at lots and lots of data, um, but it doesn't need to be done in real time, that could be, um, that could be something that's, uh, that's done more uh, in the cloud. It could, for example, leverage big data technology. And there's everything in between. So some of the um, data aspects like you know the volume velocity variety of data may affect um, your constraints in terms of where you run the analytics so really interesting section describes it we then kind of looked at uh, within this framework and again this is a couple years uh, been published um, you know we looked at some of the emerging technologies like um, big data and AI and how those uh, the context of their use within uh, driving um, uh, industrial and uh, IoT analytics. So um, we also spent a little bit of time sort of explaining without, uh, this was a little bit of a difficult uh, section to pull together, not because of lack of content, but uh, in terms of trying to keep it at a level where it's not too detailed that, um, you know, it's more targeted at, um, you know, the experts as opposed to the decision makers, but not lacking any detail that you wouldn't be able to explain it but in terms of methods and modeling you know um, there's a lot of common themes here and i think some of this is also shared with uh, ai you know how you would train models um, retrain models looking at things like you know what is um, acceptable as a um, 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 outcomes and then um, how you set up conditions for you know detecting a false positives and false negatives and this is, uh, you know, just included, this has been updated over time, but just to try and show you that, you know, um, the analytics framework really sits as part of a set of um, documents that IIC produces. So there's clearly a lot of information that we try to pull together and 
um, you know, some of it uh, comes in, out in terms of these frameworks. Others, for example, that's not captured on this picture, we publish a quarterly journal of innovation, which you can download from our website. Um, and, you know, just kind of trying to show how everything fits together. So just the key takeaways, again, it's trying to, um, this is an emerging discipline in terms of, um, you know, the industrial uh, IoT analytics, really looking at, you know, how um, some of the context, um, you know, and the advances that have happened relative to deploying technologies um, that are crossing IT and OT domains, um, really try to target decision makers, both at the technical and business level, and then taking into account, you know, some of the requirements and uh, cross-cutting concerns. And I've included some links that you can um, use to download uh, this material. There's also some, um, you know, video uh, videos that we've done around the time of publication. Um, in terms of, you know, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, scope of work moving forward, uh, we do have an industrial AI um, framework that's coming out, and again, it's going to be built around a very similar approach with the various viewpoints, but this is really focused around AI and um, spe more specifically uh, the deployment of AI systems in industrial IoT applications. So there's lots of organizations that are looking at AI, there's lots of standards coming out. This is not intended to replace that. We're not trying to be another V2, but really just more focus on industrial IoT and looking at some of the challenges, opportunities, requirements, um, technologies available when you try to deploy uh, AI-based systems. And uh, we're actually quite close to publication on this. Uh, we've completed the content generation. Um, the, the document is um, ready for what we call, or should be ready within the next month for our working group review, after which we would target publication. So we're looking to get it out by the end of the year. Um, the last section I wanted to talk about is um, we do something called IoT Solutions World Congress. So this is in partnership between uh, IIC and Fiera Barcelona. For those of you that are familiar with maybe uh, Mobile World Congress, that one is um, uh, is also done by Fiera, but um, is has a whole separate <laughs> organization that they work with, much much bigger. This is kind of a um, a, a smaller cousin, if you will, that IIC does the program for. Um, again, I apologize, you know, the slides are, you know, based on the last time we were thinking about having it face-to-face. -face. Currently, you know, we are going through the content generation for uh, what we target will be our, um, hopefully, a May hybrid event, although a lot of that will depend on uh, what happens with COVID. Um, but like I mentioned, you know, it's um, very focused on um, IoT and more specifically industrial IoT and solutions. So a lot of the presentations that you see at, at the conference uh, tend to be looking at uh, use cases and case studies. Um, and uh, we, you know, in the past we've had uh, the following different segments, connected transport, building inf infrastructure, open industry, energy and utilities, healthcare, manufacturing, and then a more general segment on enabling IoT. We're looking at, you know, sort of emerging innovation, emerging um, technologies that help do that. There are two co-located events, which uh, I believe for next year will just be treated as additional tracks. One was the blockchain uh, solutions world, and the other is the AI and cognitive systems forum. Um, I happen to uh, chair the AI one with, uh, with Eddie Leongasari from Accenture, and, and uh, so I will just show you an example of what that program looked like, um, just so you get, get an idea. Um, you know, again, the idea looking at, you know, everything from technologies that can be used to um, uh, use cases, so just um, kind of here, I'll skip to the punchline. Um, you know, part of the segment looked at industrial AI applications, part looked at, you know, the AI ecosystem and emerging standards work, uh, uh, we had a, a large segment on societal impact of AI, so this is things around ethics, for example, trustworthiness, um, the interaction of AI and digital twin, consumer-facing AI applications, and some more industrial AI applications. We tend to get more of those just because of um, uh, IIC's focus on industrial IoT, but we have also gotten um, uh, more 
consumer side things. So that was kind of a, a really quick overview of IoT Solutions World Congress. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for uh, if we had any questions. So I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Excellent. That, thanks a lot. Well, so I actually have one one question. I mean, here clearly in the IIC, you're covering a lot of interesting topics around um, IoT. And what I'm thinking, and um, for a lot of the IETF people, uh, they often the background topic is around um, protocol engineering. You know, the protocols, the data, the security mechanisms for for IoT. So where should a a person kind of with that kind of focus? look at uh, in, in the IIC, like which documents, which groups do you think would be the most the best ones to start with? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I mean, I think one of the you know more obvious areas to start would be under, for example, technology, we have our networking and um, probably networking would be the most relevant area to get started with. Um, uh, they, they just recently published a networking uh, framework that looks at some of these requirements, but I think, um, you know, like any other document, it would really help to get more input from uh, IETF. We also have the connectivity framework, which um, uh, may also be of interest. But beyond that, I think, you know, to me, I think part of the issue here is that as we look at sort of engineering the next generation of protocols for, uh, you know, communication, um, it's really taking into account some of the emerging um, requirements that are coming in. So I would imagine, you know, more on the uh, sort of frameworks, you know, the security trustworthiness frameworks uh, would probably help provide context in terms of um, what's being, you know, talked about and some of the uh, requirements. And again, you know, what when you look at what we are terming as frameworks and architecture, I, you know, um, I, I don't pretend to be an IETF expert or play one on TV, but I imagine these would be more in terms of requirements for what you might be looking at for particular domains. Um, the other areas that are interesting also would be if, let's say, there's an emerging protocol that's uh, that you are working on, uh, setting up a test bed to see uh, how that works or as a proof point uh, for a particular application, let's say in a smart factory or in medical. Uh, may be interesting to have. Um, I think I showed the example of the TSN testbed that has been very useful in terms of providing feedback. Um, some of the other areas that may be of interest are, you know, the domain specific areas like, you know, what's the work happening in energy? Is there um, the digital transformation? Are there any specific requirements coming out of application domains or use cases that are different or may differently impact uh, protocols. Um, and just perhaps, you know, um, it's a really good question. You know, one of the things that may be um, worth talking about for a minute or two are uh, next steps. So we've had um, in the past, for example, we set up a liaison with uh, the one m to m organization. And one of the things that we did is we had a joint workshop where we brought in some of our, you know, key, um, technical experts from both sides and had a three, four hour session. And one of the things that emerged out of it is, oh, hey, you know, we're both working on things that might be of interest. And we ended up publishing a joint white paper. Um, we've done something similar with OSGI. Um, so, you know, one of the things we could look at um, is uh, whether or not we set up a liaison is one thing, but we can also look at perhaps having a joint workshop in a particular area. and. If we wanted to focus on next generation protocols, that could be the theme and, you know, we could try to bring in experts from both sides uh, to talk about this. A uh, really good question. Thanks. Th thanks a lot. Well, I think that would be a very, very interesting exercise to do. And, and also um, regarding those um, documents and groups that you mentioned, maybe we could collect a set of pointers we can share um, with the director and people can have a, have a look at. Um, I think those would be a good way, good way forward here. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, typically, you know, I, I do know from our offline conversations that you guys tend to publish everything, even when it's in flight, you know, we tend to publish the stuff when it's finished and with our liaisons, we tend to exchange it. So 
we I think maybe we start by what we can exchange and then um, and then we can take a look at you know if we need to do more what steps we can do to to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Now, now looking at we have all, only actually one minute to go till the the end of the session. Um, so maybe now I'm gonna ask uh, if there are any final questions or, or or comments before we start wrapping up the session. Okay, but we can of course take also uh, further questions um, offline. Um, feel free to approach us chairs. You know, we can set up a follow up session on a smaller, smaller scale to discuss the way forward, and we'll be sharing the the slides and also the pointers for for future work. And we could also have a, a further discussion, for example, on the on the workshop to discuss specific topics. Um, so with that, um, thanks a lot, Wild, for, for this presentation. I think this was very useful, um, as you said, start of a discussion between the IETF and, and IIC. And I'm very much looking forward to the next steps here. Yeah, thank you, Ari, and uh, thank you, and Ines, and the directorate for setting this up. And thank you, everyone, for attending and the opportunity and to present to you and all the great questions. Looking forward to the next steps. Thank you very much, Pyle. It was a pleasure to have you. Okay, so with that, thank you everyone for joining and um, see you at the next IoT Directorate uh, coordination call where we can discuss perhaps the next steps here and, and a way forward. Thank you, have a nice day and thank talk you to you soon again. Bye. Thanks. Bye.